Since the dawn of humanity, we have looked out towards the stars as if compelled by an unknown force, telling us you are not alone. You are all part of the evolution of the universe on your way to higher realms of enlightenment. ancient Indians of Peru were a highly advanced civilization who lived thousands of years ago in the jungle of South America. Their traditions speak of visiting space man. At their reservations are the amazing Nazca lines which are etched into the earth and which are acknowledged as being aircraft runways and landing sites. Artifacts of great age have been found which closely resemble aircraft of today. The sensational crop formations of England have generated great interest and the question has to be asked if there is any connection with the etching in Peru. Ich kenne die Hopi Indianer sehr gut. Sie leben heute in Arizona, aber ihre alte Geschichte I know the Hopi Indians very well. Today they live in Arizona. But their old traditions say that many, many thousands of years ago their home was in South America. And that at that time they were descended upon by extraterrestrial visitors called Kachinas. These Kachinas also saved the Hopi Indians when their continent threatened to sink. These heavenly beings, the Kachinas, were the teachers of the Hopi. And even today, the Hopi Indians make figures of the Kachinas for the younger generations, so that no one should forget the visit of their original teachers from outer space. And even today, the Hopi are convinced that one day the Kachinas will come again. In this connection, it's interesting that a short time ago, I showed White Bear, one of the oldest members of the Hopi, Pictures of the Maya cities, Tikai and Palenque. He was beside himself with excitement and said, we understand that. Our ancestors built that under the guidance of the Kachinas. The great energy source of the cosmos can be extracted and focused to form a very potent electrical and magnetic power form. It is a power of great destructive potential, and the ability to control it can only be given to those of higher understanding and achievement. Such power sources were built into the great pyramids by another race thousands of years ago, when they needed recharging facilities for their spacecraft while on reconnaissance flights around the universe. The units were built within the protective framework of the pyramids to protect them from discovery. As the world focuses on the mystery of the Egyptian temples, our space probes have located similar strange pyramids on Mars. We have um, the very mysterious structures on Mars, uh, pyramids and particularly the, the large humanoid uh, face looking into the Martian sky. Um, all the um, investigations on Mars uh, with the Viking probes show quite clearly that Mars has been in the past uh, different. The physical makeup um, points to a ecological system. And um, the pyramids, again, um, really make quite clear that they cannot be possibly natural structures. I really believe that they are artificial structures. The human or humanoid face on Mars shows that if there have been visitors in the past, a long time ago, then they were humanoid. 
The readings of the early Bible told many stories of Earth being visited by heavenly teachers on blazing chariots who gave information of great wisdom. They told of how they had always been in the sky and would return one day. This is one of the prophecies of the Bible which was taken from the word of the visitors. How did modern man go about interpreting these holy clues? So we turned our faces towards the heavens in the hope of finding a deeper understanding of ourselves. To participate in the quest for universal knowledge and to hold out our hands in the search for possible cosmic neighbors. If we consider that most of the stars in the Milky Way are twice as old in our sun, um, 10,000 million years old, then obviously there may be highly advanced old civilizations, civilizations which have developed interstellar travel. So my answer would be, uh, it is more than likely, not only possibly, but more than likely, that extraterrestrial visitors are traveling to other solar systems, other planetary systems. Thus, um, we really should expect extraterrestrial visitors in our solar system observing human civilization. As fantastic as this may seem, photographs of unknown flying craft, known as UFOs, have been taken around the world, captivating the public's attention for decades. This photograph was taken in 1978 in Brazil. This was photographed in Switzerland in 1975. These two UFOs were also photographed in Switzerland in 1975. This was taken in 1971 in Austria. This one was seen in 1987 in Canada. This UFO was photographed in Germany in 1977. This was taken in Colombia in 1971. This photograph of a shiny silver object was taken in North Charleston, South Carolina in 1980. Yet another photograph from Switzerland taken in 1975. This UFO with a cloud-like vapor was taken in 1974 in Denmark. This UFO was sighted in 1977 in Uruguay. A UFO in Indonesia photographed in 1974. These three luminous flying objects were photographed in Barcelona, Spain in 1978. Every year, increasing numbers of UFO photographs are being taken by witnesses from around the world, giving growing evidence of extraterrestrial visitors. In 1946, George Adamski, a professor of philosophy, using his cine camera, took the first moving pictures of alien spacecraft. This film shows the strange flight pattern of these machines. This picture shows three balls beneath the craft serving as condensers for static electricity. This film, also taken by Adamski, shows a telemeter disc, described as being a very small but highly technical reconnaissance craft. Adamski was an amateur astronomer who had a six-inch telescope on the slopes of Mount Palomar. In 1946, he observed a huge cigar-shaped UFO and was astounded to see many smaller UFOs emerge from the mother craft. He was able to take a series of photographs of this amazing sight. After taking many photographs of these alien flying machines, an event took place which would change the course of Adamski's life. On November 20th, 1952, he had his first contact with a human-looking alien visitor. Adamski was walking in a desert canyon in California when he came face to face with an extraterrestrial standing beside a landed spacecraft. The alien told Adamski that the meeting was not by accident and that he had come to give a message. He warned of the danger we were creating by exploding nuclear weapons. 
He said that the human race had no idea of the very powerful and deadly long-term effects we were creating, which could not only destroy ourselves, but also our planet, and that the continued use of such weapons could eventually endanger our cosmic neighbors. Adensky was asked to spread this message. The alien visitor promised that he would return and meet Adamski at a later time. Adamski was later taken for flights into space, where deeper, more meaningful messages were given to help the human race to understand another point of view of our world. Adamski devoted his time to spreading the visitor's message and was later joined by a Danish Air Force major, Hans Peterson. Well, you see, after the contact in the desert, George had an inner feeling that this was not the end of it. On one of his flights, made more flights, but one in particular he was taking on board a mothership, which is a very, very large ship, who is taking all the other uh, vehicles into our atmosphere. And in there, he met a lot of people, and he met an old man, so to speak, a wise man who told him a lot of why they were here and what we did wrong here on earth and after these experiences George wrote a book inside the spaceships in this book Adamski described in detail the very advanced technology used in the spaceships, including technical information on the magnetic and gravitational propulsion systems, which work on a power found throughout the universe. He also described a magnetic pole running through the center of the ship that was also a very powerful periscope, which could observe both above and below the craft with great magnification. Adamski's alien friends gave him a pendant to wear around his neck and was told it would increase his telepathic abilities and enable him to maintain contact with them. Another witness who was truly shattered by his experience when he saw and photographed a UFO was Dr. Daniel Fry. Dr. Fry was a rocket engineer and the head of a scientific team employed by the American government at the White Sands Missile Proving Grounds in New Mexico when he took these films and photographs. On July 4, 1949, Dr. Fry was contacted by alien visitors for the first time. They informed him that mankind lives in danger of total self-destruction through means it had created itself, and that Earth technology was advancing faster than man's ability to control himself. He was told that peace was the automatic byproduct of understanding between man and man and race and race. Also that the understanding of fellow human beings was the key to building a united world. My most uh, significant experience that I had is probably the finding out of uh, the major purpose for this uh, invasion, so to speak, was to keep uh, this planet alive that we're approaching an area of controversy which could result in, in, in the displacement of all humanity because we had learned how to do that without learning how to get along with each other. When those among you responsible for your scientific achievements realize the significance of the destructive forces you are creating, only then will you understand that you are destroying your living planet which is responsible for your very existence. We are here to advise, guide, and encourage you to turn your eyes towards the creation of a planet of peace and understanding, where your invention and universal ability coexist with the creative force of the cosmos. We are your brothers of the Galactic Federation, who wish only to have you by our side. We cannot join you until your thoughts turn from self-destruction to the eternal law of universal knowledge and attainment rushed outside and there came a spaceship sailing, passing us, making a curve, going down south and coming in from the south, passing over our heads and disappearing to the north. And one hour later it came back and passed in low altitude and it passed the moon which has come up meanwhile. So you could see it was an Adamski type saucer. I've been so close to them. I have had the Telemeter disc, the small flying saucers which are making reconnaissance uh, within uh, 
75 meters. Two of them. I have what one being disintegrated on my terrace. I have seen flying saucers, the George Adamski type, uh, within 200 meters in front of my car. I have seen two flying saucers land, both cases with my wife, so I had a witness. The founder of the German UFO Society, Carl Feit, is also a publisher of UFO books. For decades, he has published books written by contactees. Many years ago, he had the foresight to realize the value of the information. There were 12 of us sitting in the garden, and the pictures were shown by this television man. And I explained them again as well as I could. And in the middle of my explanation, the baby daughter she was the youngest member of this family, called out, Daddy, what is that? And pointed up. We were all looking at the screen, and then we also looked, and there vertically above us, or nearly vertically, there was a wonderful large UFO, rather low. Of course, we were all amazed. We gazed up, we waved, and in a way gave thanks that they had come during the UFO lecture and wished to greet us, or to say, yes, we are here the ones you're talking about. Tony Dodd is a retired British police sergeant who had a close encounter with a UFO. Since that time, he has become the director of investigations for Quest International, Europe's largest UFO investigation organization. I was driving a police patrol vehicle in a remote area in Yorkshire when I saw the most amazing disc-shaped flying machine. This machine was about a hundred meters off the road, above the road. It was glowing white, bright white. It had colored lights rotating around the underside of it. It had a dome on the top with what appeared to be portholes. It was going at no more than 30 kilometers per hour but the strange thing was that it was making no sound. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. This was no doubt a real UFO. I'm convinced of this. It did not resemble anything that we have which is flying around in the sky. It uh, had an effect on my police car radio. Um, it blanked out the transmissions uh, with a very heavy static effect. The object moved away from us and disappeared into the distance and appeared to land in a forest on a hillside. George once told me that they work in all countries all over the world. And they live among us, they have jobs. One day George met a couple in New York on Fifth Avenue. He was looking in a shop in the, in the window and a couple passed him with a little boy between them. And he got this strange feeling that they were space people. And he put a thought towards them. Are you space people? Then come back. They turned around and came back and said, your thought is correct. Adamski was given insight into the purpose of his life by his extraterrestrial friends. And in this sense, all these people who have come into contact with extraterrestrial beings are confronted with these wonderful facts, and they have also had an insight into their lives. Why they are here, that's what was also said to George Adamski, that he should, so to say, be a pioneer in the field of ufology, because in the development of the human race, we now face great, higher problems. Our first face-to-face -face contact with a member of your race in modern times was a man called George Ademski. He was chosen because of his astronomical awareness and placid naivete, coupled with a cosmological awareness. During our contact, he was told many things which he was asked to pass on to mankind and was forewarned of the ridicule he would be exposed to. 
He showed high integrity and learned quickly the significance of our intentions. He was the ideal subject for our first contact. He created a chain reaction of awareness which continues to spread at the present time. He was the first seed sown by us to open the eyes of your world. The first thing that made me realize that there was definitely um, something else happening was as a result of the first sighting. After this, using my policeman's mind, I used to watch in the area where I'd seen this thing. And then over a period of time, I saw many more of them. And it got to a fairly regular event. And I saw them at close range. I saw them doing aerobatics, almost um, on occasions as if they were doing them for me, on very remote um, hillsides. And then on one occasion, one came past, it flew over my head and I flashed a light at it. And this thing turned around and came back. And as it got above my head, this was only about um, 25 feet above the ground. Um, it had a long light on the front of it, a long elliptical shaped light. And as it got to my position, the light increased in ten intensity went down and then increased intensity and went down again almost as if it was signaling me back and then it turned and flew off again i knew at this time this was an intelligently controlled machine who was acknowledging my signal i was certain before this time that there were alien craft flying around but this particular incident really convinced me of this so where are our alien visitors coming from? Or is it possible that they've been here all the time? If so, where? Military and civil airline pilots from around the world have constantly reported having the most unusual experiences in the skies, including contact with UFOs. On September 19, 1979, a UFO followed a military aircraft over Germany. This is a close-up of the object. This B-52 Ken Barra bomber was flying over Edwards Air Force Base in California in 1954 when a UFO was seen near the aircraft. Here is a close-up of the UFO. Many pilots flying B-52 bombers reported seeing UFOs. This one was photographed at 12,000 feet in June 1966 over Utah by aircraft pilot Williams. An aircraft over Venezuela had a close encounter with a UFO. This photograph was taken from the plane. In June 1976, the British Airways Concorde was being filmed in flight when a small UFO appeared. After maneuvering around the plane in a manner that indicated intelligent control, the UFO flew off at great speed. This was witnessed by the whole crew. Here is a replay in slow motion. Of the hundreds of UFO sightings made by aircraft pilots every year, the most amazing one was filmed from a commercial airliner by passenger Gene Oldfield as the aircraft cruised at 9,000 feet over Stafford, England on April 2, 1966. The film clearly shows the ability of the craft to perform maneuvers and feats of acceleration far beyond our present comprehension. Here is the film again in slow motion. This was one of the early films taken of a UFO. The dramatic movement of the object showed rapid, almost instantaneous changes of speed and direction, which sparked intense curiosity and confusion among the public and scientific community. No earthly aircraft of the time could perform like this. While filming from a helicopter for the US Navy on April 15, 1966, Lee Hansen, a professional photographer, shot these pictures of a flying object at Catalina Island, California. The craft, which had no wings or tail fins, was 30 feet in diameter and moving at approximately 150 miles per hour. No signs of a propulsion system were visible. 
This film, shot by James Waters in Colorado on July 23, 1963, shows a UFO moving across the sky at tremendous speed, followed by a second one. This is the same film at 1 12th speed. An analysis showed that no earthly aircraft could possibly fly so fast. In late December 1978, a record number of UFO sightings were being reported by radar operators and pilots in the area of Wellington, New Zealand. Just before midnight on December 30, 1978, Quentin Fogarty, a reporter, and a television team took off in an Argosy aircraft to fly to Christchurch. Shortly after takeoff, Fogarty was informed by ground radar that they were being followed by several UFOs. During the 50-minute flight, UFOs were seen and filmed by the crew. The UFOs were described as having a luminous base and a transparent top. The objects were performing incredible aerobatics. This movement was captured on a single frame of film. We have been present in your skies for hundreds of Earth years, but because of camouflage devices, you have been unable to observe us. Your cosmic evolution has now developed and the time has arrived for you to ascertain the existence of other life in your universe, resulting in us making our presence known to you. Our choice of contacts has been governed by their spiritual ability to comprehend our manifestations without anxiety or aggression. The movements of our vehicles in the air, which you find so strange, is due to the fact that we have overcome the force which you call inertia and can fly in any direction instantly without experiencing any form of pressure change. Our propulsion systems work on the principle of electromagnetism where gravity is of no significance. The three spheres sometimes seen below our craft are our drive systems but can be detached individually to function as surveillance probes. The magnetic pole within the axis of our craft has many functions. It contains periscopic lenses for high magnitude observation and assists in the absorption of static power for recharging purposes. It seems to me quite clear that a humanoid, a humanoid civilization will very likely try to find other humanoid uh, civilizations in the Milky Way. If we just take the Milky Way as our place uh, for travel, um, I'm not talking about extra galactic civilization now. The um, possibility of finding humanoid civilizations would always be of interest. Just like our astronauts, if we send them away in the search for life, we'll very likely try to find uh, life which is a kind, which um, is similar. Uh, if an astronaut has a chance to visit a planet where there's plant life or insect life, or another planet where there's humanoid life, uh, he very likely will travel to the planet where there is humanoid life. And um, so it should not surprise us that the extraterrestrial visitors are always described as being humanoid. The following sequence of photographs and film was taken by the astronauts. While in space, they had many encounters with UFOs that are now being revealed for the first time after decades of secrecy. On the Gemini 4 spaceflight on June 3, 1966, astronaut James McDivitt took a photograph of this cylindrical object. On the mission of Gemini 7, astronaut Frank Borman reported seeing these two objects flying in formation. On the Mercury 1 mission on February 20th, 1962, John Glenn took this picture of two glowing objects. On the Gemini 11 mission, September 13th, 1966, Pete Conrad and Richard Gordon observed a cluster of UFOs alongside their craft. They described them as large and very bright. During the Apollo 11 mission in July 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin saw these two UFOs, which were in orbit around the moon. 
The astronauts filmed the extraordinary glowing objects from the Apollo 11 spacecraft and reported to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas that the UFOs even accompanied them to the moon. Many astronauts made their own private films while on space missions. This film, shot by James McDivitt in a long sequence, shows the remarkable aerobatic ability of UFOs. The astronauts faced UFOs so regularly that they became part of their everyday life. Because of restrictions, however, they were unable to describe their encounters to the public. One of the first to break the silence is former astronaut Brian O'Leary, a professor of physics and an astronomer from Princeton University, who comes forward for the first time to speak of the reality of visitation from out of this world. What I do know from my own experience and from scientific investigations and experiments is that UFO phenomena and a range of other events are part of our reality, as incredible as they may seem. Jetzt war es dann endlich soweit. Der erste Mann war auf dem Mond gelandet. During their moonwalks, a giant glowing UFO hovered above their heads. While in orbit around the moon, a huge object remained in view for a considerable amount of time before it suddenly disappeared. This UFO was seen above the landing site. This cigar-shaped UFO was photographed from the orbiting space module. On this very first trip into the unknown, the astronauts repeatedly reported to mission control that they were being escorted by unidentified flying objects. After landing on the moon, the astronauts stated that the UFOs were still present in the distance, hovering near a large crater. They were well aware that they had been observed throughout their entire mission. It's also like sundown again. <laughs> yeah, powder. I was rolling on the moon one day in a very, very month of December. Hey. May, May is the month. May, that's right. May is the year of the month. When they're much to my surprise, a pair of the eyes. Hello, Ryan, this is Houston. Hi there, we lost you for a while. Yeah, we sure did. Da 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 da. Hey, Ryan, this is Houston. The momentous leap to the moon led to the dawning of the space age. Space travel opened up endless opportunities for mankind to explore new frontiers. NASA's plans are already well underway for colonies to be developed on other planets beginning with Mars. Motherships very rarely enter the Earth's atmosphere, but on one rare occasion, this remarkable film was shot of such a ship flying at low level over Germany in 1980. The object was seen by other witnesses in a nearby village who reported seeing three smaller craft emerging from the larger one. They stated that the craft was at least 100 feet long. This film of a cigar-shaped mothership was taken in Rhode Island, America on June 3, 1967. The leaf effect motion of the ship is common with most sightings. Craft of this size and shape have been reported all over the world. This aerial photo was taken by Inaki Ozis while flying at 8,000 feet in February 1968. Probably the same cigar-shaped mothership was photographed in Texas 10 days later. Over the following few days, an object fitting a similar description was reported by various witnesses. Life aboard our motherships is ruled by a mixture of self-discipline, love of each other, and the merging of all spirits into one. Every need is catered for in respect of rest, recreation, and meditation of the soul. 
Illness does not prevail, but analyzation and anecdotal equipment is always ready in case of unexpected or unknown space microbes attacking the craft or our bodies. Our food is comprised of a rotation of the many choices available on our own planet, but does not include the flesh of other life forms. We do occasionally take the fruit of certain organic trees and shrubs found on other planets, but only when they are known to be totally safe and pollution-free. Our water on the craft is produced by cosmic conversion. All byproducts are disposed of by the disintegration of the composite molecules. The psychological spirit of each of us is at one with the elements which surround us. And when we are at one with our universe, we are at peace. My personal views on UFOs are that these are alien piloted vehicles. Um, when I say alien, um, I mean alien to anything we know, that possibly they come from other worlds, but I think it's highly likely also that they come from other dimensions, other time spheres, and um, that there, there isn't one type of alien coming here. There are probably many of them, all from different areas. When people report these things, we get such a, um, a variety of things reported, so many shapes, so many forms and this appears to cause the confusion because there is such a variety of these things but really speaking if these things are visiting us from a, a whole host of different areas one would expect them to be different forms different machines and i think this personally is the answer to it Meanwhile, we scan the skies with optical and radio telescopes of great power, which penetrate the universe for 15 billion light years, watching, listening for signs of intelligent life. Large numbers of people on Earth wait and watch in the hope that one day they may be contacted or visited by visitors from space. In Russia, a large crowd of people who had gathered to watch a famous singer being filmed saw more than they had bargained for when a UFO suddenly appeared above their heads. The camera crew quickly focused their camera on the object and recorded an aerial display that lasted several minutes. The crowd found this more intriguing than the singer. Even she eventually stopped singing to watch the UFO. Numerous UFOs are seen over Russia regularly. These balls of light are identical to those reported in Belgium and the rest of Europe in 1990, which attracted extensive attention on top military and civilian levels. In April 1990, this cigar-shaped UFO was filmed over Russia by an amateur. These flying objects are now acknowledged by the Russian military as being alien flying machines. The nucleus, the authentic nucleus of the UFO phenomenon must be um, our research field, and that is certainly worthwhile. Um, However skeptics uh, may um, talk about the UFO phenomenon, um, whether they uh, call um, people who have encountered psychopaths or even scientists who concern themselves with UFOs um, as cranks, we simply have to accept, if we inform ourselves, that there's a small percentage of absolute authentic cases which represent the UFO phenomenon. And we must continue to investigate this nucleus. It will be worthwhile. When I first saw my UFO, I always quote my UFO now, um, you've got to bear in mind I was dealing with something like this with the clinical mind of a policeman. So my immediate reaction was, well, what makes a thing like this tick? How does it go? How can you get an enormous machine like this which doesn't make sound? Why does it look so beautiful? 
Why did I see it? Why was it there? There are so many whys. And I knew I had to find out answers to these things. It was very, very difficult. There was no easy way of finding an answer to something like this. But it seemed to me that things naturally came my way. I started to receive reports from people as it became known I was interested, interested in this subject. And then I had so many other incidents following this of close encounters. It, it was quite amazing, really, because these things seemed to know where I was, even when I wasn't on the initial hillsides where I found them. I had occasions when I would be driving down a country road, then suddenly one of these things would be in the sky, flying alongside me very close. And it, it was almost a cat and mouse game. And I had nothing but no fear never any fear because there was never anything directed towards me which would indicate there was any hostility and so I got to a sort of affection for them I had to keep thinking what kind of technicians put something like this together uh, because it was such an amazing thing but I knew I knew that this thing was not from here for the past 45 years People from every country have reported seeing UFOs. The descriptions of these objects have been all too similar, despite the fact that the witnesses live thousands of miles apart. Witnesses include astronauts, pilots, scientists, and police, even presidents of the United States. Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan have spoken openly about their seeing UFOs. Since 1945, an estimated 5 million UFO sightings have been reported from across the world. Most sightings are of singular objects, although many are of two or three. In some cases, large formations have been spotted. The greatest number of UFOs usually appear after 9 p.m. Although a large percentage of these sightings can be explained as natural phenomena, many cannot. Thousands of people are asking questions, what are these UFOs? Where do they come from? Why can't I see one? Why are they here? And more and more people want to communicate with the extraterrestrials, to learn more about them, get to know them, to understand. Soon after the dawning of the 20th century, the winds of change began to blow. Events were to take place which would change the course of mankind forever. The atomic age had arrived. As man detonated weapons of immense power, lights started to appear in the sky in a way that suggested that something was following the course of events. The shattering thought imposed itself that we were perhaps not the only inhabitants of the universe. Since the beginning of civilization, we had been watching the stars, never dreaming that they, in turn, might be watching us. History was about to change. Because these lights appeared suddenly in the sky over Washington on July 20th, 1952, moving from the White House to the Capitol, hundreds of people witnessed the extraordinary event and it left them stunned. The lights instantly jumped from one position to another. They were also observed by high military officials who knew what the lights were trying to say. The public had never seen anything like this, whereas the military had already a long history of involvement with these alien visitors, but had kept it from the public. An immediate emergency meeting was called to formulate a plan to divert public attention away from the occurrences. From that day on, it was decided to place the subject under the highest classification of security. Then came the first announcement to mislead the public made by Chief of Air Intelligence, Major General John Sanford. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. From that day on, the biggest secret of the century began. How did it all start? After the first atomic bomb was detonated, 
More tests were made of the effects on the environment and human subjects to gauge the degree of contamination unleashed. No knowledge of the devastating long-term effects existed at this time. Here in New Mexico, an army base close to a small town called Roswell became the focus of attention on July 2, 1947, when Bill Brazel, a farmer, found a crashed disc-shaped craft on his land. The military arrived on the scene and quickly isolated the spot when they found debris scattered over a wide area. They also found four dead humanoid alien bodies who had been ejected from the craft. Because of many recent UFO sightings by the military, they accepted the existence of visitors from outer space who obviously possessed a technology which was far beyond our understanding. Now for the first time, they had tangible evidence and were eager to learn its secrets. Roswell was the home of the 509th Bomber Wing, the sole American atomic bomber group. Major Jesse Marcel, an army intelligence officer, was engaged on the recovery operation and asked Walter Hott, the Army Public Relations Officer, to prepare a story for the local newspaper. He told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time, which is what I did. The story was published in the local paper. The news was also prepared to be aired by the local radio, but Judd Roberts, the radio station manager, was warned not to broadcast it. Sorry. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, you are, we, we understand that you have some information, and we want to assure you that if you release it, on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy. And so we suggest that you not do it. And he said, when I mean in jeopardy, like maybe three days. Preparations were made at Roswell Army Base for the transport of the wreckage. Robert Shirky witnessed the secret handling of the parts. They came in the front door, straight down the hallway, and right out onto the ramp to climb into the airplane. These were the people that were carrying parts of the craft uh, flying saucer at that time, a uh, UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. And it was very short, very quick. Uh, Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the uh, ops office. And I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see two. <laughs> On instructions from the Pentagon, Thomas Jefferson DuBose and General Ramey created a cover story saying the crashed object was a weather balloon. We used that in order to uh, persuade the curiosity of the press. The wreckage was loaded back onto an aircraft and flown out under cover of great security and secrecy to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The pilot kept silent for several years, but informed his wife after the story appeared in a newspaper. I guess now that uh, they're putting in the paper, I can tell you about this. I wanted to tell you for years. He said, I want you to read this article because it's a true story. And I not only know that it's true, but I'm the pilot who flew the wreckage of the UFO to Dayton, Ohio. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was considered the most technologically advanced research center in the United States. The wreckage of the Roswell crash was dismantled for analysis. The matter was considered of such importance that the orders came directly from President Truman. Under the cover of the CIA, Truman created a group called Majestic 12 for dealing with and covering up all information about UFOs. President Truman gave the task of handling UFOs only to the highest ranking generals. After the Roswell crash, a special group of scientists was formed and facilities built to be prepared to deal with any further UFO crashes which would occur. 
Wendell Stevens was a lieutenant colonel in technical intelligence in the U.S. Air Force and is now a UFO investigator. Now having a, a, an extraterrestrial vehicle and some bodies in their hands didn't know when the next one would come down, where they came from, what they were going to do about it. There were a lot of unanswered questions. And the United States was in a turmoil at the time administratively because we were shifting from a war economy and a military industrial command structure to a civilian structure. Uh, so the military was still dominant and they wanted to keep control of this until they knew what was happening. So they created, and remember, General Marshall was our Secretary of State at the time. He was a four-star, a five-star general. Uh, these people selected certain representatives from the military industrial complex that they controlled, generals and admirals and certain scientists that uh, worked with the military and worked with uh, industrial planning. These men were designated as a task force to take charge of any event that followed. And it one did. Almost a year later, on the 25th of March of 1978, the next one came down, I'm sorry, 1948, the next one did crash, and it came down under observation by radar so that we knew where it landed at the time that it struck the ground and a helicopter was over it in less than an hour. It reported what it observed and the plan generated by these people from the military industrial complex after the Roswell crash was immediately put into place. All of the generals and admirals and advisors and scientists were contacted and ordered to proceed to a base in Colorado where they were driven, picked up, and driven to the crash site. Now all of these men are, have gone to the scene to see for themselves uh, what uh, an alien vehicle looks like, and they were going to advise General Marshall directly, who was controlling everything from uh, remote position to telephones, on how to proceed. And when an operation is that big, you can't cover everything up. We discovered that the owner of the property where the, the vehicle came down was uh, arrested in his house with his family, and they were kept in the house for four days, not allowed to go outside or anything. All the roads in the area were blocked. All access was closed. People that lived close enough to know something about it were kept in their houses. Now, if it never happened, then this evidence wouldn't exist. But now we are finding solid evidence that something strange did happen and that, that these events actually took place. Then we found people who observed the recovery of the craft from a distance that saw the, the, the task force moving across uh, off roads over country to uh, a secure military facility at Los Alamos. Uh, and, and with these leads, we were able to turn up other witnesses, all of whom had been sworn to secrecy by their superiors at the time they participated in these events. And only a few of them would talk to us, and only on condition that they not be identified because of their vulnerability. Uh, what happens in a case of violation of security oaths of this nature, they could lose all pay and allowances due or ever to become due. They could be imprisoned. To, they could be fined a, a lot of things that none of them could stand. Through Secretary of State General Marshall, the security of the UFO situation was intensified. A closer relationship developed between the military and Majestic 12. As time passed, the power of Majestic 12 grew stronger. Virgil Armstrong was an intelligence officer with the CIA and worked with highly classified assignments. He retired with the rank of major. I received documents which said that a UFO had landed in the middle of White Sands, New Mexico, proving grounds. And that this object was inert, was under surveillance, and uh, would be kept under surveillance until they could determine uh, whether it was hostile or friendly. It later turned out that uh, it was friendly in that the occupants were dead. And uh, when we got aboard, there were five bodies. The bodies uh, were diminutive in size, in other words, 3.5 feet. 
The largest one was uh, just under four feet. Two of them were obviously the commanding officers uh, because two of them wore epaulets on their shoulders. Uh, later, it turns out that they were all male. When we flew them back to Wright-Patterson, of course, the examination, physical examination, and the autopsy, of course, revealed that they were indeed all male. From descriptions given by several witnesses, the aliens have very large eyes, a small nose, and a small mouth. They are usually about three feet six inches in height and have no body hair. President Truman ordered a heightened level of security after the capture of a live alien from a UFO which had crashed. Because of the ever-increasing numbers of UFO sightings at the time, it was decided to create a project called Blue Book, which was designed to suppress public knowledge and create an atmosphere of ridicule around the subject of UFOs. Professor J. Allen Hynek was a professor of astronomy and an astronomical advisor to the United States Air Force on their UFO educational program. And I know the, the, the job they had. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. Uh, and I saw it in my own eyes happen that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which is quite a few, they made point of that and, and let that out to the media. Things that, the, the cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, the media away from them. For their, they had a job to do, uh, to, whether rightfully or wrongly, to keep the public from getting excited. A live alien was captured in 1948 after a UFO crashed in America. He refused to communicate for one year and was given the name EBE, -E, or Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. He later began to communicate and gave details of his home planet. EBE -E had a large crystal which he linked to his mind telepathically and was able to communicate with his own race. He was also able to see into the past and future and perform many other amazing feats. He told of believing in the universe as the supreme being and stated that his race lived in harmony without wars and had nearly eliminated all diseases. He said they lived to approximately 800 years of age and that their technology was far in advance of ours. The authorities were amazed by the things they were shown through the crystal. EBE was able to communicate with huge spaceships which were holding orbital positions thousands of miles from the Earth. He told them that their crafts were capable of reaching areas in the universe beyond our imagination and that they were operated by thought control coupled to biological computers and consequently did not have any control systems as we understood them. He talked about his planet and how their technology had created a system where everything was self-functional and did not require a workforce to operate it, and that everything was monitored from a central control system. He said that technicians were present there. He said their power source was eternal energy from the cosmos. He told them that his race didn't have a government like Earth, but a society governed by wise elders who sat in council to make decisions of policy. They did not have a monetary system because the needs of the people were catered for by the Federation, which made them all equal. At the request of the aliens, a meeting was arranged with President Eisenhower in 1954. It took place amid tight security at a secret location. At this meeting, negotiations took place regarding the permitted presence of the aliens on Earth. Eisenhower told the aliens that the world was not yet ready for them. Eisenhower witnessed an alien uh, demonstration of technology and power at Muroc Dry Lake, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base. I believe we made a deal, uh, and the deal was that uh, in exchange for super technology, super weapons technology, we would agree to ignore the abductions that were going on. He... Uh, made it more military-oriented than, say, a civilian president would have. 
And it's this, I think, that has let his actions, let the real power of the executive office slip through the hands of the president into MJ-12. The president of the United States does not have a high enough clearance to know the whole thing. And it's interesting to note that above top secret, there's 38 levels of clearances. Eisenhower is the last president to have a full briefing on the alien problem. There was a disdain of elected officials throughout the intelligence and military communities, and uh, they just didn't like elected officials. So uh, every president since then has not had high enough clearance to know the whole problem. Now they know there's aliens, they know we've recovered saucers, and they know that uh, we're trying to get technology. But the, there are certain other things which probably only about 25 people on the face of this earth know. When coming down to earth, it ceases to be free space with systems to monitor every move. I happened to see flying saucer on several locations on the radar. I even intercepted with four jets in 55 and it was clear to me that the saucers we intercepted could hear what I told the pilots because they reacted on my instructions to the pilots. It was one day when one of my people in the radar called me and said, Major, I was captain at that. Captain, we have uh, something on the screen which passes with a speed of 18,000 kilometers per hour. Impossible. Nothing could fly with that speed. I went out there, yes. They were passing with 18,000 meters, kilometers per hour. All of a sudden, after some while, they did not pass anymore. They were stationary around the field. And they came and they left without we could see it. All of a sudden, they were there. All of a sudden, when the sweep came around, they were gone. I contacted the operations officer and the station commander. They both came out and they wouldn't believe me. I said, give me four aircraft and I'll intercept them. Okay. Sometimes there were about 20 objects around the field, and sometimes we were down to a, a few. It was fog, and therefore a lot of people afterwards said, oh, it was inversion, but it was not. It's proven afterwards it could not be inversion, which is a meteorological phenomenon. So at 11 o'clock, I had four uh, jets at the runway, and at 11 o'clock, the fork lifted so we could take off. And I ordered the four jets to take off. In that moment, there was 12 objects around the field. And when I said, you are cleared for takeoff to intercept unidentified flying objects, 10 of them went away. Right when the sweep came back, there was only two left. One 10 miles north of the field, one 15 miles south of the field. I sent the two aircraft to the north and the two aircraft South. Two aircraft to the north came first, and I said, you, your boogie, which is the object, is 12 o'clock spread ahead. 12 o'clock, distance five miles, altitude unknown. Do we have it inside? Gone. Came the next one. When it came up, I said, your boogie is 12 o'clock, range five miles, altitude unknown. Do we have it inside? Gone. So it was clear they could hear what I said. But while the visitors monitor our every move with their superior technology, being technically advanced does not always ensure their own safety. This was proved by the UFO crash in the Kalahari Desert in 1989. One of the most documented cases of all time referred to a 60-foot wide spacecraft which was forced down on the border of South Africa. This craft impacted with the desert at high speed causing a crater 450 feet in diameter and 36 feet deep. Official military documents reveal that the craft entered South African airspace at 1.45 p.m. on the 7th of May, 1989, and was intercepted by two Mirage jet fighters. Because the craft failed to respond to communication, one of the fighters was ordered to attack the craft with an experimental laser cannon. This caused the craft to lose altitude and crash. After the craft was retrieved, uh, it was removed to a secret Air Force base. And on arrival at this base, um, it was found a door had partially opened in the side of the craft. Uh, hydraulic um, pumping gear uh, was brought to the scene and the door was forced open. Uh, when this was done, two aliens staggered out of the craft um, and it was found that one appeared to be seriously injured. 
they were immediately arrested and removed to a medical center where a medical team was sent in to try to assist. The authorities at the scene entered the UFO and hieroglyphics were found inside the machine, uh, alien hieroglyphics of course, and various items of electronic equipment were also removed from the craft. When the military entered the craft, they quickly removed portable equipment and instruments, some of which were considered useful as potential weapons. This was not certain at the time, but was clarified after scientific investigation. Also found aboard the craft were a series of hieroglyphics, which indicated that the aliens had a written form of communication. The writing gave the impression of an alien alphabet, but it is not known if any of the scientists present were able to understand its meaning. Data found on the craft were stored on a system of silicone slides. It was obvious to everybody at the site that they were dealing with a very advanced technology, including the propulsion system. As more and more alien technology comes into the possession of our scientists, more understanding is being gained about the physics involved in producing propulsion systems capable of taking man deep into space. Although many years have passed since the beginning of the UFO era, the veil of secrecy has remained to keep the public uninformed. Despite the suppression of information, millions of people throughout the world are still seeing and reporting the presence of UFOs in our airspace. And many more millions are now firm believers in the presence of extraterrestrial flying machines. They know that UFOs exist. I think what has happened over the years, the government has uh, lied so much that they have painted themselves into a corner and it's almost impossible for them to tell the truth today. The biggest secret in the history of mankind and the government is not going to let this out. You, there is no way to get anything out under the Freedom Information Act. In Russia, the subject of UFOs is now out in the open. Marina Popovich is a retired Russian cosmonaut and fighter pilot. During her military career, she was twice awarded her country's highest military order, Hero of the Soviet Union. She is now one of Russia's leading UFO researchers. Ten years ago, people only made jokes about this subject. Now the attitude to UFOs is very positive. The majority, 80%, think there is extraterrestrial intelligence and that this intelligence is trying to establish mutual contact with us. Now cosmonauts and pilots are more willing to report their contacts with UFOs when they have taken place. Unlike the rest of the world, the Soviet Union has an openness about the subject of UFOs. They even have a monthly television program devoted entirely to it. In the near future, university courses will also be available to study the subject. Several Soviet generals have already stated that there is no question as to what UFOs are. We know they are alien spacecraft. Technology has advanced rapidly over the past 50 years for all the world to see. But in secret locations, amid tight security, the true advance of technology is hidden from public knowledge. From one such location came the stealth bomber. This futuristic aircraft is the only type known which has the ability to fly into radar protected areas unobserved, almost without sound, to perform whatever task is necessary. The technology used in the production of the aircraft is a giant leap forward from conventional technology, and the question has to be asked, where did it come from? At one super-secret US government test facility situated in the Nevada desert, strange glowing lights are regularly seen performing aerobatic displays which are far beyond the capability of our known aircraft. They seem to be intelligently controlled, can this be yet another example of some secret, very advanced technology? Or are the authorities hiding some exotic foreign contrivance? Here at Area 51, also known as Dreamland, is the most highly protected and secret facility in the whole of the United States. Bob Lazar, a physicist, worked on special projects within this complex and felt compelled to reveal what he saw. They are actively and have in their possession uh, alien spacecraft and they are actively uh, undergoing analysis and flying them. They set up 
and produce their own gravitational field. Just as the Earth holds all matter down, they produce that same field, but out of phase, and it, it repels itself. The effects that can cause the way in which everything operates is, is by all intents and purposes, magic. I mean, it is so far beyond uh, our level of technology. Why is such technology available only to the few and not to the whole of mankind? Have we the right to know? Are we ready for it yet? Or is the race for technological advantage more important? Why keep a secret about probably one of the most important events in history that there's been contact from an alien civilization? It's a significant event in history, more significant than anything. With the tremendous distances involved, travel to the stars would seem impossible. But with man's endeavor and resourcefulness, these problems will be overcome as they always have been in the past. Scientific estimates tell us that there will be a breakthrough in space travel in the near future. When the boundaries of distance break down, the Earth will become our home, the universe our world. Energy is the lifeblood of civilized society, but it's also a tool that has to be controlled. They are flying on what we call free energy. They take it out of cosmos and fly on it. And you could do the same with your boat, your car, your machinery. Everything on Earth could be completely free. Do you think that the oil companies and the coal companies and the atomic and so on and so forth would accept it? Never. Despite our problems, we have gained a new conception of cosmic energy. Perhaps all the technologies which are being put together at this moment in time are catching up on our alien friends, which I very, very much doubt. But I'm sure that is the reason this technology is being put together. You've got to realize that things are not always as they seem. And once we can get out of this thinking, out of this box we're in, that there is something more than what we are being taught, what we have learned. There are things outside the scope of this. Um, then I think you'll begin to see the potential for people from out there visiting us. And I'm not just now, not newly visiting us, but I've been visiting us for hundreds of years. Our presence within your solar system is to observe the evolutionary progress and environmental change is occurring not only to your planet, but to its people. Using a special observational technique enables us to foresee potential difficulties which may arise and, if necessary, give you advice on the course of action you need to overcome it. To achieve these aims, we employ the use of many types of monitoring equipment, each with the responsibility for a different area of scientific investigation. Our use of telemeter discs of all sizes as remote-controlled, sophisticated recording and analyzing vehicles is one of the many types of drones. We observe every aspect of your world and its inhabitants, from the environmental changes and pollution levels to the microbiological disease potential of mankind. Our techniques also enable us to record and analyze thought patterns and therefore anticipate man's course of action before it is taken. There is nothing about your world and its people we are not aware of. In the last few years, there is an evolution um, in the whole extraterrestrial problem. Um, an evolution so far that the um, sightings and the encounters become more concrete. Uh, we accumulate more and more cases um, where we uh, get more and more information. More information is released by the governments. Um, we know now that there was a cover-up for so many years. Um, we have always speculated about this cover-up. Now we have proofs. We know that the secret services, not only in the United States but in other countries, have really fooled the public. 
uh, and very likely um, extraterrestrial visitors uh, know about this plot. And um, it is uh, not surprising that um, in the last years um, more concrete information is released. Probably this may be a preparation for official contact. Perhaps it's in the interest of extraterrestrials uh, to establish contact because um, humankind is in a very difficult position. Um, this does not imply that we uh, must depend on extraterrestrials to save our planets. We have to do it ourselves. But nevertheless, um, we are in a phase, a phase where we possibly take the next evolutionary step, uh, a step that is so important because it uh, will decide whether we will survive or simply vanish. A circular shiny object passes in flight. You think to yourself, so the stories are true. What should we do? I'm absolutely convinced um, that there is a mutual origin of humankind, of human beings, and some of the extraterrestrials which come and visit uh, Earth. Um, I have various reasons um, uh, to maintain this point of view. There is a group of extraterrestrials which are really identical with human beings in their size, in their physical look, in their physical makeup. If we take um, the reports of witnesses seriously, and I do, um, there are quite a number of cases where these extraterrestrial visitors have, rem have made remarks confirming this point of view. They do not officially land in Washington or in Mos Moscow or in London, but they're simply seen rather unobtrusively in such a way that the media is arguing constantly whether UFOs exist or do not exist. We know that they do exist, at least a small nucleus. And whatever their intentions are, I'm sure there's a development uh, in the last few years that it will not be long until we find out. Are the spaceships announcing their presence by leaving their footprints in the cornfields? If so, how? The cornfields of England, home of the amazing phenomenon known as pictograms. In 1990, 1,200 complex symbols appeared in southern England. Some showed a remarkable resemblance to carvings found on ancient monuments. One opinion is that they are a message from spacecraft. Another is that it is energy coming from the ground, reacting with energy from space. All agree it is intelligently created and possibly connected to the nearby stone megaliths. The pyramids, one of the eight wonders of the world, are monuments to a forgotten civilization. But how did they achieve such feats of engineering? And why are there identical structures on Mars? It is said that the pyramids were built by another civilization for the purpose of containing energy devices to exchange cosmic energy. The pyramids acted as a focusing device to focus energy on the planet at the zenith, which is in exact alignment with the Pleiades. Some people have had contact with beings from the Pleiades who told them that they were here to help us. When asked, why do you help us, they said, We would like to tell you about the importance of cosmic law, to live by it, not to neglect it. The greatest gift to yourself is to understand yourself through cosmic law. In our world, we give our children this understanding so that they will have a richer life. We come from throughout the whole universe, and we will reveal ourselves to you more and more until you come to understand the universal language. My first encounter, I was determined, if it took me the rest of my life, I was going to find out that day, what I had seen that day. And I have never let up from that moment in time. And it has been worth every minute and all the money I've spent on it, because now I'm a far wiser person than I was when I started. I know things now which I would have never known had I not got involved in this thing. That there is a far higher 
force out there operating than we could ever conceive. And that they're here amongst us. They come and go as they wish. They are watching us, guiding us, and directing the direction we go in. Of that there is no doubt. Elizabeth Clara is one of the most important alien contact cases of all time. She was born in South Africa in 1910 and is a woman of great wisdom. Between the years 1954 and 1963, she had many meetings with another race. One man whom she called Akon told her that he was from the solar system of Proxima Centauri. She developed a deep friendship with Akon. He took her on a four-month visit to his home planet of Meton, 4.3 light years from Earth. Meton is a world with two suns. She was told that space was a big laboratory and was given great knowledge about the universe. She understood the structure of the cosmos and the laws of light frequencies immediately. And as requested, she passed her knowledge to science where it was of great benefit. She later went on lecture tours and wrote a book where she shares her insight into the structure of the universe and passed on highly valuable scientific information to the world. She said, the road to the stars unfolds within a spaceship of great beauty and simplicity, generating her light from the cosmic plasma of eternity, never faltering, always alive and pulsating, shaped like a galaxy with a halo surrounding her and the shockwave glowing. We are embarking on a dialogue for which a common language has yet to be created, and which, when in full swing, will pose questions we have never ever envisioned, not even in our wildest dreams. There is life elsewhere, and therefore an extraterrestrial civilization to which we stretch out our hand evermore, whose attention we wish to attract, and with whom we wish to make contact. I am convinced that we shall be able to make contact on a broad basis. After all, there are already very many who have. And this contact between people is just as important as that with the universe. On her many journeys into space, Elizabeth Clara learned that Archon's race lives in harmony of body and mind, which is the foundation of healthy existence and responsible for the elimination of disease. They know that most diseases are caused by emotional or psychological stress. Archon told her that all cosmic neighbors looked at our world with watchful eyes. They see that the natural world is dying through the imbalance which we are creating in nature, reducing the resources we live on, and they are out there waiting to help. When asked why they didn't come more often, they said, to come here, we have to make many kinds of adjustments to the body, because we are uncontaminated. This spacecraft was seen coming out of the sea near the Canary Islands. UFOs have been repeatedly seen rising out of the water throughout the world. It is known that they are using their advanced systems to help the world to decontaminate areas of high pollution. For instance, green fireballs are appearing in areas of high radioactivity for the purpose of neutralization. Many contactees are told that help for the Earth by our alien friends is allowed, but only to a certain extent, because they cannot interfere, since we all have a free will. This is a cosmic law. Life in our own planet is different to what you experience on Earth. We have long overcome the negative aspects of aggression, jealousy, and power. Although we are very advanced by your standards, we lead a simple life of love, mutual respect, and harmony, each integrating with each other in a like manner conforming to the cosmic law of mutual harmony. Our family unit is the integration of like souls, which is a form of higher love beyond your comprehension. Children are born of these family units to evolve into even higher levels of understanding. 
partners are not tied to each other as with your earthly rules. The merging of auras of the twin souls is a bond of such love and understanding that rules are not necessary. We do not have rules as you understand them. Law is a code of conduct. We do not require a code of conduct as you perceive it. Age is of no consequence to us. We merely exist in this form for a term of many times your lifespan and are then reborn to a higher level. Our harmony with our environmental surrounding is absolute. Elizabeth Clara was brought to our planet by Alcon as a step towards bringing understanding to your race regarding the life and ways of cosmic neighbors. The mutual love which existed between them was a natural harmony of souls. Akon could not have lived permanently on your Earth because of your contamination. Our recreation is very different from that on Earth. We do not have sports of violent physical contact and do not participate in anything which creates rivalry. One great enjoyment is to use our brain power either singly or jointly against what you would call computers. Our music is a combination of vibrations colors, aromas, and visual effects. But unlike yours, it is of a meditational nature. It was very, very difficult. There was no easy way of finding an answer to something like this. But it seemed to me that things naturally came my way. I started to receive reports from people as it became known I was interested, interested in this subject. I received reports in growing numbers until I was receiving reports in hundreds. And then the, 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 the net spread, and it wasn't to a local area. And then it went to the whole of England. And then slowly but surely it spread until the world came in. And information was being fed from many, many directions. And many, many people helped. And as this information grew and grew, the fact that there were solid objects and other type of objects flying out there there were other intelligences became very very real there is a wealth of information documented and otherwise now of the real existence of these um entities aliens whatever you wish to put the name on them the problem is in our society there has been a very very well orchestrated aura of ridicule imposed on society so that people who were seeing these objects were afraid to report them for fear of ridicule. People in positions of responsibility saw these things and many have spoken to me but they always speak in hushed tones behind closed doors and when you ask them why they say well if I was to make this public what I've seen I would lose my job. This is the syndrome which has uh, been among, among society for many, many years. There are more people all the time coming forward. We're beginning to break this mold of ridicule. And the reports are coming from all manner of people. I've had them from doctors and pilots and military personnel. You name it, I've had it from them. And there, we, it's like a snowball. It's gathering momentum, it's gathering size. And it will not be long before all the population realizes that these are out there. We are not the only people here. And when the realization of this comes to the front, then I feel that we will all be lifted on a higher level spiritually. Man is beginning to respect the universe and the laws of the cosmos. Therefore, he will learn a great deal faster.